Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Welcome to worship at the Adamsville Presbyterian Church. It's marvelous to be with you. My <laughs> wife and grandkids and everybody in Columbus are not with us today because my new daughter-in-law is having a bridal shower at her mother's place. But uh, uh, I'm sure glad to be with all of you. And Wayne, you're our lay leader. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, our call to worship. Jesus came into our world to give us knowledge of God and to share God's gift of life that we might become God's children. Many people, many people did not recognize Jesus as God's son and many still do not receive him as Lord. But all who do receive him, God adopts as his children who are reborn by his divine love. We want to meet Jesus in a new life, reborn in God's family. Our invocation. Our Father, we thank you for this time of worship. Open our hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit. Prepare us to accept Jesus Christ anew as we celebrate communion together. Build faith in each of us. May no one leave this house of prayer without being closer to your love. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I think we have a weary traveler. Come to me, a weary traveler. Come to me with your distress. Come to me, you have your burden. Come to me. Do not fear, my yoke is easy. Do not fear, my burdens light. Do not fear, be dead before you. Do not run from me and fight. Take my yoke and leave your troubles. Take my yoke and come with me. Take my yoke and beside you. Take and learn humility. Rest in me, O weary traveler. Rest in me and do not fear. Rest in me. Rest and cast away your care. Very nice. You'll join me for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in his Son, Jesus Christ, the Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. A prayer of confession. O God of love, you have revealed yourself in the life of your son, Jesus. He is our light, our life, and our hope. But we are of this world, and this world is indifferent to your gift of love. We are among those to whom your son comes who are prevented by sin from recognizing him as Savior. Forgive us our sins and deny our relationship to you. We are your sons and daughters. Restore us to your fellowship, that we may enjoy the blessings of being your children. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. I announce the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven, but for the asking, our faith. Thank you very much. That was an absolutely beautiful hymn. I am so, so very glad that you found that, Nikki. Thank you so very much. Get all the young kids to kind of listen. Um, I'm preaching about something, a passage that I really enjoy today. Um, it's a very important passage. Jesus speaks it. And what he's saying is, come unto me. The word come is a very simple word. Jesus didn't use anything complicated to get his point across. Come unto me. What a marvelous, beautiful phrase that is. If somebody says, come, uh, you know, even my dog knows the word come. Because if I, and Miley doesn't know that many words. She knows Miley, and she knows good girl, and she knows bad dog, and she knows come. And if Miley's in the other end of the house, I'll either say Miley or I'll say come. And when I say that, Miley comes a trotting to me. So that's one thing. Even my dog can understand that simple word. Although my dog's pretty smart. At any rate, um, we get many invitations to come. Jesus gives us a special invitation. And if Jesus says come, oh, I want to stop and listen because I want to follow what he says. And then the next phrase he says is come to me. That is a really important thing. And how do you little guys think that uh, uh, we can come to Jesus today? I'll tell you, but just spend three or four thinking seconds thinking about it. Come to me. How do I come to Jesus? I know. I can pray. And whenever it is I pray to Jesus, then I know that uh, he's going to take me. And that's kind of a wonderful thing if we stop to think it. If Jesus is who he says he is, and I believe he is the Savior of the world, it's a wonderful thing to know that we can always come to Jesus. And then he says, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for my soul or to your souls. You know, people get exhausted in life. And they get all kinds of pressures on them. It can be bad grades in school. It can be problems at work. It can be sickness. It can be a thousand different things. But life is a lot easier if we know we can take every problem we have and every burden we have and lay it upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that with all of my heart. We can take all of our burdens and we can take all of our problems. And God is going to answer these requests. Thank you so much. I love talking to you young people. Something to report to the church is our friend Lawrence McGranahan is back at St. Vincent's Hospital, and he's real sick. He's in intensive care. And I know Norma was up here in Erie yesterday. She did get to see Lawrence for a little bit at Vincent, and then her granddaughter was having her high school graduation party. So I rather suspect that she's probably at her daughter's house right now. And uh, it's so good to have Wilma back and to have her walking and uh, She's, uh, she's been with us for worship, but now she's walking. They put a walking boot on her, and that's good. And Mia continues to get her treatment in Pittsburgh. Um, always pray for Pat Hill because she's recovering nicely. Uh, I don't have anything else. If anybody does, let me know. We're going to pray. Our Father in God, it is wonderful to be able to come to you and to cast all of our burdens upon you. It's good to know that there's never a second in the day for any human being where they can't take their fears and their anxieties, their pressures, and cast them upon you, O willing Savior. 
and we give you thanks for this great gift. We live in a troubled time. Many people, Lord, just don't know that you're present. They no longer know whether there's a God who's active in the affairs of life. And we know that you are. We pray that your spirit will be alive everywhere, that people will feel your presence, that they will know your transforming love, that they will move by the depth of your great care. As always, we pray for world peace. We pray for a time when there will be war no more, when all people can rest without fear. We pray that you will be with the leaders of the earth, even those who would laugh at your name. We pray that your spirit would energize them to do that which is good and that which is moral and that which is right. We pray that you will protect our president and those who lead this nation. Give them a wisdom to do that which is best for our people. The coronavirus still continues to spread. There are so many who are sick. We hear reports every day of people who are in critical condition or who have died. We pray that this coronavirus will come under control, that very quickly it will be no more. Be with our research scientists, give them wisdom to come up with this vaccine. We pray, Lord, that somehow out of the midst of this, people will hear your love and your clear voice. We're in the midst of our summer. We pray that you will keep people safe. We ask that you will heal the sick everywhere, that you will give wisdom and strength and comfort to people as they make important decisions that they be made in such a way that life improves. We pray that you will comfort the many who mourn, dry their tears, give them hope. We pray, Lord, that you will be with the many who come to journey's end. When that moment comes, gently carry them over the valley of the shadow of death without fear. May they open their eyes in eternity and may they see your face. We pray, Lord, that you will protect your whole church every single congregation on the face of the earth. We pray that each of them will be filled with your love. And we ask that somehow out of all of the work that is going on, people will clearly know that you are busy in the affairs of life. And we love Adamsville so much, Lord, this is our home. We pray that quickly we will be able to reopen, but we pray you will bless the people of our congregation, pull us together in love and trust for each other. May the gospel have power right here in our own community. And may we be the vehicles by which all of this occurs. But all of this we ask in the name of our savior, the Lord Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Nikki, it's all yours. Okay. I hope you guys enjoy seeing seeing the church if you've missed it as much as I do it feels great to be here and it's awesome that everybody's on video you know we're here together so that's awesome mm -hmm. I keep finding voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I'm never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and Thank you. 
Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Thank you very much. Very, very nice. I appreciate that. Thank you. Our scripture lesson from the Hebrew scriptures is taken from the 39th Psalm, beginning with the seventh verse. The psalmist poses a question. And now, O oh Lord, what do I hope for? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am silent. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am worn down by the blows of your hand. You chastise mortals in punishment for sin, consuming like a moth what is dear to them. Surely, Everyone is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not hold your peace at my tears. And then one of my very favorite passages from the New Testament, it was last week's lectionary lesson, beginning with the 25th verse of the 11th chapter of Matthew. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise 
and the intelligent have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Every member of every church I have ever served is very familiar with this particular passage of Scripture. And I admit I absolutely thrill in the statement of the Lord Jesus. I have quoted it at every single communion service I have ever celebrated, be it at Sunday morning worship, Saturday night live worship, or in home communion. In all scripture, there is no greater statement than this upon the subject of work and peace in the midst, or rather, rather rest in the midst of work and, and strife, and the responsibilities and the tensions of daily living. But the text is a great deal more than that. It is the first great public invitation of our Lord Jesus Christ to all of the peoples of the earth. And what Jesus is basically saying here is that all of us can become part of the family of God, but for the asking of our faith. I spoke with a friend this week who asked me a question that I couldn't answer. They said, how could a good God let this coronavirus continue to rage? How could we, for another whole group of months, be absolutely terrified to go outside? And I would be the first to say this is a question that cannot possibly be satisfactorily answered. There are times in human history when it is not clear what God is doing if God is doing anything at all. We see this in the first two chapters of the book of Exodus. Genesis concludes with Joseph and his brothers in Egypt. Joseph has a marvelous position. He is prime minister over the entire land. Centuries come and go, new kings, take over the throne. And all of a sudden, nobody remembers who this Joseph was. And the people of Israel slowly fall into slavery and bondage. God is not mentioned in the first two chapters of the book of Exodus, except where it says that the midwives had great faith. Pharaoh's daughter and Miriam use their wits to save the baby Moses. Then when we get to chapter three of the book of Exodus, God again enters into the picture. For a season, the people had faith, even though they could not see what God was doing. And it takes a person of real courage and real stamina to remain faithful during those hard times when God's vision isn't quite as clear as it is at other times. We see this in the book of Esther. The most unusual truth about the book of Esther is that God is not mentioned one time in the entire book. People live there by their wits. They live by their courage. Deliverance comes to the people of Israel for the Jews because Esther listened to the advice of her uncle Mordecai and because of a whole long fortunate series. There were ages 
when Israel cried out, God, where are you? I'm looking as hard as I can, and I simply can't find you. For a season, they saw and they heard nothing. The good news in the Old Testament is that God's silence is always broken. God's silence never lasts forever. God promises to hear the cry of his people. In the Old Testament, the hiddenness of God as well as the presence of God is an integral part of their faith experience. And I want to suggest that this can be a great lesson for each of us. Remember, Jesus from the cross found the worst loneliness you could possibly feel. He's ready to die. And in pain and agony, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was agitated and grieved when he entered into the death experience. Secularists today argue that God does not exist. They say we no longer need God. This is a claim that absolutely infuriates me. They argue that all things can be rationally explained if given enough time. For many, God seemed to fade out of the picture without a fight. Human beings have attempted to take destiny into their own hands. At the time of the American Revolution, deism, just for about a decade or two, was quite popular. This is the belief that God created the cosmos and then he stopped working in it the belief that God's work was done and he walked away from it. God no longer being involved in the affairs of the world. For many people, this absence of God is not a problem. It eliminates the question of ultimate right or ultimate wrong. It lets everything comfortably become nothing more than a shade of gray. Many argue that God's personal involvement in life is not to be taken seriously, so why pray? We cannot expect God to do anything good with this coronavirus. We cannot expect God to intervene and bring the races together and let Americans just enjoy each other's company. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ with all of my heart. I believe in the master's death and I believe in his resurrection. But I also would cry out in pain, God, were you present at Auschwitz? How about the gulags of Russia? Where were you when those planes ran into the, flew into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon in Washington and that filled in Shanksville, Pennsylvania? I believe it's all right sometimes to yell at God we just don't understand why life is working out the way it is. Faithful protest is legitimate. As long as we wait upon God, and as long as we keep our hope in God. I remember the first time I was called to respond to a crib death. It was back in 1968. That's an awful long time ago. And I remember sitting on a front porch in a home in Orwell, Ohio, with a father and mother who were weeping. And I didn't know what to say. All I could think of was I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. And I will come again and call you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Fifty-some years have passed since that conversation. And with all of the thinking and all of the reading and all of the praying I have done in all of those years, I still can't think of anything better or more profound to say. When I look at disaster, 
I go to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. One of my favorite verses of scriptures there. Now I see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. But then I know as I am known. Faith, hope, love, these three abide. And the greatest of these is love. This is the promise that in eternity we will have all of the answers to all of the questions we cannot answer now. It's the promise in eternity. We will have full knowledge of life. Whenever it is I face personal tragedy, my personal starting place is my belief in the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember Jesus' promise, I will be with you always, even to the close of the age. Just as old Israel, my memory of the living God, and what this living God has done through history gives me strength and hope in the present moment. It is my per memory that permits me to rely on my faith. So in times of crisis, I would urge all believers to use their memory and then use their faith. This week, I buried a dear friend. Her name was Marguerite um, Bartlett. And she was 100 years old. I remember back 30 years ago, her husband at the time was 72. His name was Clyde. And Marguerite always called, or not Marguerite, Magdalena always called this man her man. But he had a horrible, horrible cancer. He only lived about two minutes from the church, and every day for a month I would stop him on the way home before dinner just to say a prayer. And the faith he had and the faith she had at the time had a way of strengthening my faith. It has nothing to do with the story, but it's a funny story. After Clyde died, she continued to be a greeter at church on Sunday morning, and one day she walked out to the church. Uh, the church, I'll never forget this. She got in her car, and she had two purses on her. What she did was hug people, and somehow she put her arm through the staff of this other lady's purse, and without either recognizing it, walked out to the car with two purses. And I had a lot of fun because I said, you are one good church purse thief. And her family teased her for years about that, and she was so embarrassed. But at any rate, my reason of bringing this up is the fact that we raise this question. Is God really acting in our age? How do we know that God is involved? And one of the ways I answer it is by looking at the people I've ministered to. And it's so amazing how on so many different occasions, when I examine the lives of the people I have served, I can see the hand of God present with them, and I can see God's power. I've seen it with so many of the good folks at Adamsville, so many stories. Last year with Betty Mora, with Vi Nottingham, with so many who have come to Journey's End. And each person who is a believer in Jesus Christ really has the ability to share the fact with other people that God has been present in their lives and God has made a difference. I have been with well over a thousand people when they've died. I've done over 2,000 funerals. And hearing the stories and watching the people and the faith has built my hope. And watching the Christian who is a member of my church live their daily lives as they work one with the other, as they share their hope, has convinced me that God is real and that God always is present. Out of such experiences, my faith has radically grown. And of course, the message of the gospel is that all people can really triumph, even in troubled times. Something to avoid. Never, 
ever suggest that a disaster somebody goes through is a punishment from God. I can't explain why some people live and some people die. I can't explain why it is when I recognized that heart attack 20 years ago and I went to the hospital and Dr. Ferraro worked so hard and the next morning we talked about the heart attack and I said, why did you do what you did? He said, you were dying when you came in here. And my response was, thank you, Dr. Ferraro, and thank you, God. A dear friend of mine moved a year ago to Denver, Colorado. And on an evening, he and his wife and high school daughter were driving up in the mountains. And the car went off the side of the berm and it dropped 200 yards down into a gorge. For some reason, the car landed perfectly in a creek on all four tires. Paramedics got there and they were sure they were gonna see dead people. The high school girl and the wife went to the hospital and were released that night because they had no surgeries. My friend stayed one night in the hospital and was home in his own house the next day. All of these things an amazing coincidence or are they the hand of God? I guess without bragging, I'm always gonna say it is the hand of God. And that doesn't help a person that just lost somebody they loved in an accident. And I can't answer that, but I can thank God for life and preservation. For a believer, the 39th chapter of the book of Psalms, the seventh verse is very appropriate. I read it just a little bit ago. It says, and now, O Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. We need to trust in our God for he will ultimately come to our rescue. We need to search for the divine embrace. We need to trust our God because our God will not fail you. Remember, God is creative love. God is sustaining love. And God is redeeming love. God meets our brokenheartedness right here where we live. In the midst of our suffering and our confusion, God gives us hope. The compassion of God is always available but for the asking of our faith. This is the meaning of Jesus' death and of his resurrection. Oh, do not take unnecessary chances. That's stupid. Be very careful with this coronavirus. Pray for all people. And always, whatever the problem is, take our fear to God. For Jesus did say, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I live by this promise, and I hope I hold on to this verse until the moment when I take my very last breath on this earth. Offering time. What I think might be interesting, if in another week somebody would just take 60 seconds to say why the Church of Jesus is important. I think if we talk a little bit about what good the church does and what the importance of the church is, we can find a reason to really support it. And offerings are important, not only for our local work, but for our mission work. I know the church has always been my life. I would not live in a place 
where I couldn't find other Christian people with whom I could worship and share my experience. The church is so important because it is the place where the Holy Spirit dwells. Our Father in God, we pray that you bless our offerings and may we do your work well always. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. And then the bulletin Jean sent out, she listed ways that we can contribute to the church. Let's sing hymn number 432. That's Nikki. How clear is the vocation, Lord, when once we heed your call to live according to your word and daily learn, refresh, restore that you are Lord of all. But if forgetful we should find your yoke is hard to bend, if worldly pressures weigh our mind, then love itself cannot unwind its tangled stain of care. We marvel how your saints became and hindrances more sure whose joyful virtues put to shame the gentle way we wear your name and by our thoughts obscure your power to cleanse and and what you give us more to come together or alone and over routines or ventures may we not cease to give the cross you hold upon all your endeavors It was a bit of a different version, Reverend Jones, and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'm very happy. You do a wonderful Thanks. job, and that's Thanks. good theology in that singing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and in the life everlasting. Amen. And now we'll just sit around and